So we have a poem here, uh, Emily Dickinson's number 568, We Learned the Whole of Love. Why don't I read it and then we can talk about it, okay? We learned the whole of love, the alphabet, the words, a chapter, then the mighty book, then revelation closed. But in each other's eyes an ignorance beheld, diviner than the childhood's, and each to each a child, attempted to expound what neither understood. Alas, that wisdom is so large and truth so manifold. Uh, Lily, what's the, if somebody said to you, what is the poem about in a phrase or a sentence? What would you say? It's not easy, but. Uh, I think it's about learning how to, learning how to read and how things that we read incorporate the world that we experience outside of them. That's great. That's, that's cool. Dave, would you do the same? Do you have another one sentence summary? Uh, yeah. Anything that follows alas to me takes on special meaning. So we're talking about wisdom and truth. And to me, this sort of says that wisdom and truth is out there in the world. And we can try to, it starts out with reading it in a book and that's trying to contain it artificially. But the yeah. fact is that it's all the oh, way, it's all out there. Are you saying that Emily Dickinson, who's famous for her meta-poetry, where everything is about the alphabetical consciousness that creates the words, that in this poem she's kind of moving outward from beyond that? That's, that's how I read it. This is a, a realist Emily Dickinson. Hmm, interesting. Kamara, do you agree with that? Um, I was thinking more on like a different side of things. I was thinking about how the part that really spoke to me was, but in each other's eyes and ignorance beheld, and then attempted to expound what neither understood. Mm -hmm. So this idea of finding wisdom and truth and things un not understood was what I really latched onto. But I also agree with Lily's interpretation. I think that's a really cool interpretation. So Kamara, mm -hmm. um, each other's eyes suggests two, you could do each other with three idiomatically, but mm -hmm. I take, I circle love and I bring it down to each other's eyes and I hear what is either a cliched or a fresh notion of people, of, of, of love exchanged in a look. Yeah. Right. So could this be about the love of two people or is it a love of parent and child? Um, well now mixing our two interpretations, I'm thinking about how, I don't know if this is real, the book and the person, each other's eyes, there's an ignorance between the two and there's a knowledge and a knowing that both can understand. That's what I just jumped to, <laughs> sorry. No, no, that's good. Lily, we learned the whole of love, the alphabet, the words. Well, what's going what on I here? was gonna say is, um, this is like one of those examples of something in an Emily Dickinson poem that sounds almost, not really lyrical, but it sounds like it makes a lot of sense and then you think, wait a second, how did we get from love to the alphabet like that jump is amazing yeah, so how do we get from love to the alphabet well i mean you, you can be theoretical here Go i ahead. guess theoretically like you need to understand what the word love means if someone says to you i love you and you don't know the alphabet you don't know words and you don't know the our internalized concept of what love like means based on maybe she's talking about biblical love in this first stanza um or like god's love or whatever she's talking um, about new testament love she might be. I mean, if you're learning the whole of love, that seems like, in this context, it seems very school-like, learning alphabet words, chapters, and the Bible, um, inter interpreting the mighty book and Revelation to be like biblical words. There's almost a um, hierarchy or a progression right. from alphabet, which are the cons constituent pieces, right. Words, and then the next level would should be sentences and paragraphs, but we go to chapter. Mm -hmm. Am I right to think that? And then we go to book. So, uh, letters, words, chapter, book. Why that progression? Does that help us at all? Um, well, that's conventionally, if you are going to be in like kindergarten and going to first grade or whatever, um, or not in Emily's time because she didn't go to kindergarten, but um, <laughs> like you, you need to know the alphabet before you can learn how to read words because you can't read words if you don't know the alphabet. Um, and then words make up a chapter and then a book and then chapters make up a book. Um, 
Okay, so Dave, if the first stanza gives us a progression, as Lily describes it, uh, educationally of learning, you learn the small pieces and then you can graduate to a chapter book. I think we used to use the phrase chapter book and then the whole book. But then, typical of Emily, she turns with a butt. So there is a new mode, maybe a non-progressive mode, maybe a, a non-alphabetical mode. Where is she turning to? Well, not just the but, but Revelation closed, which is pretty pretty important since Revelation you can't you can't avoid the biblical connotation, but it also just uh, uh, as a word it means to open, uh, you know, to reveal. And she's closing it. Now we're moving on. But and, and of course no. it is the final chapter of the New Testament. And what happens is, is ever, there's a lot of love in that chapter? <laughs> in the Re Revelation? <laughs> what Dragons. Happens? Dragons. End of the world, right? I guess if you love the end of the world. <laughs> Apocalypse. Well, it's like if you haven't learned love by that point, then you're something. So it's, it's <laughs> in a sense not a pun if we've got the alphabet, we've got the words, we've got the chapter, we've got the book, and then you read Revelation and you close. Mm -hmm. And then you so go actually, to even though Go ahead. Well, then, then you go right into ignorance, to something mm -hmm. purer than, than attempts at human description, something that we had before we learned these things. We have an ignorance so of childhood. So this is an alternative to learning, an alternative to education. Kamara, what kind of alternative could this be? Let me really simplify it as a way of setting up this question. Okay, so we learned, we, we, did the, we went to school, we were schooled in alphabetical consciousness, which created readers of us. But actually there's an alternative way of knowing not knowing and that is to look at each other and uh, I don't know what. What's the alternative? Um, communicate in some type of way without without these fundamental structures that we learn in school. Without um, pedagogy, without curriculum, without learning traditions. So what mm -hmm. would that be? Um, uh, um, uh, I'm thinking a communicative and a simultaneous process with one equals. Equals is what I'm saying. Cool. So what <laughs> if love gets carried down and is the theme of both stanzas? In other words, we learned the whole of love, and this is how we did it. And now in the second stanza, but another approach to love is, and if that's the reading, what is the another approach to love? Dave. I hate to say it, but it almost is Whitmanian in saying that it's manifold. Why do you hate to say it? Because we like, we to, like, we, we like to <laughs> we like to construct the dichotomy between okay. Dickinson and Dickinson. But um, it does seem that she's talking about it existing, it being out there, it not even needing to be conveyed through communication. It's just there. For, so, Lily, is this a paradox? Um, of like, well, another approach to love is to look into each other's eyes and know from the ignorance that we behold. Well, okay, so I feel like earlier in this discussion we took the last two lines to be equating wisdom and truth, but I actually think she's making a distinction because she says, alas, that wisdom is so large. So wisdom but would be the first answer. Wisdom mm -hmm. is sort of being equated to School the whole learning. of love, like mm -hmm. large, okay. a large whole. Mm -hmm. And truth is manifold, meaning like I'm equating manifold with the each other's eyes, meaning that um, we're, the manifoldness is the uh, two people talking to each other, not mutually intelligible. But that's not a bad thing. Um, that's like the manifold aspect, and that seems to be what she's celebrating as an alternative to wisdom, which is large and doesn't, mm. um, is like monolithic almost. So if you circle, take your pencil or pen, you circle closed and bring it down to manifold, you get closed open, right? Yes. Yeah. Singular mm -hmm. many. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now Kamara, mm -hmm. attempted to expound what neither understood. Let's just take those two lines. Can you translate that into easier English? Attempted to expound. Um, try to explain or describe. Um, okay. What What is it that they're trying? Something to that they both don't understand. They equally equally don't understand. Yeah. And that would be the eye contact thing. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. Okay, Dave, what are we doing with this? Is that just a standard Dickinsonian paradox? We're trying to describe something that neither of us understood. It's pretty powerful. Yeah. You know what, I, I read that, I look up a couple lines to diviner, and mm -hmm. I see that not just as an adjective, but as a noun, too. So, uh, in a it's sense... These, ignorance that is diviner than ch a child's ignorance. Yeah, but these are the people are the ones who can be... The, they can be the diviners. It's not just received knowledge. It's not just things that we describe and accept. Mm -hmm. But each and every one of us can be a diviner in our own right. All right. So, Lily, alas, what's the tone and what's the gist of alas there? I know we talked about it a minute ago. But. Well, usually you say alas um, for something that's a lost cause or something that you lament or are upset about. Um, or maybe you like you've you've come up against like a big conclusion and you're almost like exhausted by it or something. So I feel like, um, I feel like she is regretting that this uh, scenario of in each other's eyes, the two childlike figures can't be the all the time scenario because she's saying, alas, uh, wisdom is so large and truth so manifold. Um, almost like we had this moment of in each other's eyes, but it's not, it can't, it's hard to make it be all the time because wisdom is so large. So I'm going to go around and ask each of you to say in a kind of form of an assertion, which Dickinson does not typically elicit from us, but if you had to assert what the poem is arguing, what you think it would be? Why don't we start with Dave? What's the poem arguing? We experience truth you know, born from ignorance when we're blank slates and then when we learn how to describe it we find ourselves losing the ability to to describe it and even losing losing track of it wow so ironically as we move from innocence to experience in learning we move from experience to, in, to innocence kind of a uh, two two different directions lily what assertion is being made, if any? I guess um, that there is no inherent truth to words, the way that it's forced on, upon us to learn it in school based on the uh, hierarchy or linearity of the first stanza, so from alphabet to words to chapters to the book, which might be the Bible, through to the doomsday scenario at the end of the Bible, and then it's over. Um, there, that there isn't this inherent truth to words, and what we're actually learning is conventional understanding or conventional wisdom or cliched understanding of what love means. But actually, two people saying I love you to each other don't mean the same thing, but it's okay that they don't mean the same thing when they say I love you. Like each person saying it for a different reason or motivated by something different. Um, and it's okay that they didn't reach uh, an objective understanding of what love means because that's impossible. Pretty good. Kamara, what's, it, what's being contended here? Um, so I think she's arguing that knowledge can be made in multiple ways, and um, but the type of knowledge that I think she is arguing for is the type of knowledge that is um, with people, that is outside. Of, arguing for it, meaning preferring it. Yeah, preferring it. Preferring that over the... Um, the whole of love in this closed book because it can be closed. Mm -hmm. Is that what she's saying? Um, knowledge with people, with communities um, is more um, more about not knowing and that's the type of knowing that she's preferring. Okay, so th that's great. Now what we're going to do is one more time we're going to go around and this time I want you to focus on what Emily Dickinson does, as she typically does, when she writes a poem that is at least partly a meta poem. That is to say, a poem about writing, a poem about poetry, writing about writing, writing about alphabetical consciousness, which is a phrase I used earlier. To the extent that that's the case, where does, how does it get manifested in the poem? Where does it go? So this time we'll start with Lily. What do you think? Well, um, I mean, you can't ignore the fact that um, anytime a poet mentions the alphabet or words, um, it keys us into a metapoetic reading kind of automatically because we know that the poem that we're looking at is composed of words made up of the alphabet. So she, that's like our first clue, I guess, right in the first stanza. And um, in terms of the, in each other's eyes, ignorance, attempting to expound what neither understood, 
a poet at the end of the day is trying to represent something and get that across to a reader. So Dickinson's going to be on the side of you. You will attempt. I'm going to attempt to expound, and ma neither maybe the neither is neither the reader nor I, Dickinson, like fully understand. But that's okay because it's more about the space of being in each other's eyes, like uh, looking at the poem physically, than it is about communicating the closed book revelation mm, content. Fantastic. All right, Dave, take a shot at the meta poetry here. Well, uh, to some extent, she's talking about the problems with trying to describe these things, attempted to expound what neither understood. Uh, but then she does. Alas, that wisdom is so large and truth so manifold. She's describing it. She's saying it. She's saying this is a hard thing to do. We can't do it. Oh, but I'm doing it. <laughs> That's cool. Kamara? Do you um, like meta poetry generally? Oh yeah. Why? Why do you like it so much? Did you? Um, ah, Sid <laughs> Corman. It isn't for want. Yes. Of something to say. That's one of my favorites. Something to tell you. Something you should know. But to <laughs> detain you. How is Emily Dickinson detaining us? Um. So I'm thinking about how. Um, even the reason why I love that poem is because you're in the moment of the poem and the words and you're on the page, but you're also, you're working it out with other people. There's this like outside the poem and inside the poem process like simultaneously. And that's what I think is happening in this poem is that by making us, um, by helping us become more um, recognizing of the words that she's actually saying, um, she's also helping us to get outside that poem and think about like this is the poem, but like each other's eyes is important as well. Yeah. Um, oh well. I, so my, I'm I'm just gonna go for a final word here. I I agree with what's been said uh, in this last round a lot, and I guess my way of summarizing it would be to focus on what might be a radical interpretation of the love that one gets of people, imagine two people in love staring at each other. <clears throat> the radical reading of it is to continue the meta-poetry and to imagine, as I think Lily implied, that the seeing that's going on there is either the same as or is like the reader reading the words. Mm -hmm. So if reader and writing self, the writing self that has been written in the book, she's not so presumptuous as to think that the Bible is a way of reading herself, but the fact that a writer looks at a book, when a writer looks at a book as opposed to a reader looking at a book, it is a kind of alternative love to the book learning that is uh, standard and progressive. So in the first stanza you get conventional notions of reading and writing. In the second stanza you begin to get something that's very different. When you close the book what you get is the relationship between the reader and the writing or the reader and the written self. And that is going to be something much more open and powerful than the standard notion of reading.